Bom dia, gente. Como combinado, a gente vai fazer a sessão de hoje em inglês, tá bom? Então, eu vou mudar aqui, ligar a tecla SAP aqui. So, thank you very much for being here. I'm just going to uh, make a small introduction. I would like to thank uh, David Eisenhaus and Thomas Bustamante for uh, coming uh, today here for this, uh, for this uh, lecture on, on David's new book. I would like to especially thank David, who took a whole week off his schedule to be with us here in Sao Paulo, you know, leaving behind family, his university, the certainty of electricity, uh, many things, uh, just to be with us. It's a great pleasure to have you here once again, David. It's, I think, the second time you've been here, yeah? Uh, five years ago, and now to discuss your new book. I would very much uh, like to thank uh, Arthur, who is, uh, will be chairing this session, um, Iago and Martin, who did a wonderful job in the preparation for uh, David's stay with us. Uh, this would not be happening without them. I would also like to thank uh, uh, Gustavo Monaco, the head of our uh, Uh, Department of Postgraduate Studies, because uh, the funding came from uh, the, the Postgraduate Department. And uh, I hope that we have a wonderful week. This is only the first of three sessions. There's going to be another session on Wednesday and another session on Friday. The Wednesday session will be here at the same time from 10 to 12. The Friday session will be at the Sala da Congregação from 11 to 1. So uh, please note that there's this uh, small difference in the Friday session. Other than that, uh, I will give the word immediately to Arthur and uh, thank you once again, David and Thomas, for your uh, for your time and for your uh, your participation. So good morning, everyone. I would like to repeat Professor Maffei's thanks to everyone who was involved in organizing this, Professor Ronaldo as well, and to Professor Maffei who agreed to join us from the very beginning. To David and Tomas, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited. And, and I thank you in the, main, in the name of the Sao Paulo uh, University Law School. I'll briefly introduce both of our guests and then pass on the word to, to David. So uh, Professor David Eisenhaus is professor of law and philosophy at the University of Toronto. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a corresponding fellow at the British Academy. Uh, he has taught in many different universities in places including South Africa, England, Can Canada, Singapore, New Zealand, Hungary, Mexico, and the USA. He holds a doctorate from the Oxford University uh, and law and undergraduate degrees from the University of, please excuse my pronunciation, with Waters Rand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, he has authored, authored many books over the years. Um, he has done early work on South Africa during the apartheid regime and the legal philosophical consequences of uh, that studies. And most recently, he wrote this book called The Long Arc of Legality, which will be the subject of our panel today. Professor Tomás Bustamante is a professor at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Um, he has also passed uh, through many different universities, including the University of Edinburgh, He was a Global Research Fellow uh, at the NYU. Um, he has experiences in, in the fields of legal theory, philosophy of law, political theory, and he's one of the leading uh, Brazilian scholars who study David Eisenhaus uh, in, the, in Brazil today. So thank you both again for being here. I'll pass on the word to Professor David Eisenhaus. Well, uh, thank you very much, Arthur and Rafael. Uh, I did come here a few years ago. I think, remind me, it was 2018. And uh, I had such a great time here that it was required no effort on my part at all to decide to come back. And the great time was not only being uh, just in being in Sao Paulo and experiencing Sao Paulo, but uh, talking to the people here, because as you can tell from my accent, perhaps, but also from my first work, I am South African. I uh, grew up in apartheid South Africa, 
first learned about law in apartheid South Africa. And somehow I found that uh, in places like uh, Colombia, uh, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, that there, because people have come from an experience of dealing with authoritarian government, wondering about the role of law and curbing the excesses of authoritarian government, have a great deal of, in common with people from this part of the world who are thinking uh, philosophically about these issues. So it's always a great intellectual pleasure for me to talk to people uh, in Brazil and uh, elsewhere. And uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for agreeing to come. Uh, Arthur mentioned that uh, Thomas was at NYU a couple of years ago. We happened to coincide there and found that we uh, have a huge amount in common. So when uh, this event, these set of events first uh, started getting organized, I asked uh, Arthur whether it'd be possible to bring Thomas here. I don't know whether you'd be able to make the efforts. I'm, I'm really so happy that you came. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to, uh, in the car on the way from the airport yesterday, where Arthur and two others very kindly picked me up, uh, Arthur suggested that maybe I should talk for up to an hour. Maybe I'll do that, but I'll try to avoid doing taking so much time just because I did have a, an opportunity to read Thomas's uh, comments this morning, and I don't want to cut uh, your time short. So, so let, let me uh, start with a slight apology. The first talk I gave here several years ago was called uh, Lawyering and the Rule of Law in Dark Times. And now, now the times are darker, but uh, the, 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 the topics that I talked to people about at that time uh, are topics that I'm going to be talking about uh, again today, and that's because I was working on the book which appeared uh, last year. So some, so some of the content of, or maybe a lot of the content of my talk today will overlap with uh, the content of that talk all that time ago. Yeah. And uh, I also need to apologize to Arthur, who uh, spent several months at the University of Toronto last year and sat through a course I was teaching. So I'm afraid that some of this stuff that I'm going to be talking about today will be more than familiar uh, to you from that course. Yeah. So, so, so let me start with the book, which you have a, a uh, photo of on, on the slide, The Long Arc of Legality. That uh, cover is taken from one of the most famous uh, artists of the Weimar era, uh, George Gross. And uh, it's a scene from Berlin, in, uh, probably in the late 1920s or early 1930s. And I put that on the cover of the book because the uh, suite of uh, art that this is taken from is called Eke Homo, Behold a Man. And uh, this uh, street scene in Berlin uh, depicts a kind of secularized version of this uh, religious idea of Behold a Man. And uh, this idea is actually central uh, to my book. So the two claims that I put in uh, the slide, the first claim is that uh, philosophy of law has long been in a state of deadlock, unable to make uh, progress in solving the puzzle of law's authority, that law is both a matter of right and might, and the book then attempts to break this deadlock. And the way it seeks to break this deadlock is by saying, arguing that law's authority is due to the fact that legal afford, order affords to its officials resources which enable adequate answers to legal subjects who ask, but how can that be law for me? And a large part of the project of the book is trying to make the legal subject, the individual who's affected by the law, goes to an official, gets a ruling, uh, finds something wrong with the ruling and says, how can that be law for me? And uh, that, that's... Uh, links to this idea of eke, eke homo, this is a person who just happens to be there, the law is affecting that person, uh, what kind of challenge uh, can that person make uh, to uh, the law, and uh, how does uh, philosophy of law help us to understand this? Right, so in, in the next uh, slides, I'm just going to go through some of the sources of uh, inspiration for my project. The, 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 one is Thomas Hobbes, which is why he features in the subtitle of the book. Uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, usually has a reputation of being a highly authoritarian thinker, and this reputation can only be cemented if uh, one reads the sentence which I take from Leviathan and which I have on the slide, where uh, Hobbes says that law is the public conscience by which the subject has already undertaken to be guided. 
because what that says to the subject is uh, if you want to know what you must do, what you morally ought to do, look to the law, because the law is a repository of the moral values which you should take as the public conscience of your society. And, and that, I think, uh, can seem to be a highly authoritarian thought. But the, one of the claims that I make in the book, especially in the very long chapter on Hobbes, is that if we look at Hobbes's very complex account of what I call the modern legal state, we will see that this idea of uh, the public conscience of the law is uh, not as authoritarian as it might seem. So, so let me jump uh, right to the last chapter of my book, which I'm happy I've done because uh, Thomas is going to be talking all about uh, pragmatism to the, the great American judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, who often is thought to have had a very reductive account of law and in some ways a kind, a kind of authoritarian account of law. So Holmes is uh, famous for saying, this is I think his most uh, famous uh, line, that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. And what is that experience? Probably the next most famous line, the experience is the experience of the bad man, the bad man who just cares to know whether he's going to get in trouble uh, from uh, the law. But I think if we, one looks more closely at Holmes, one finds actually a very sophisticated and pragmatist uh, legal theory. So Holmes says in uh, the essay from which this line about uh, logic and experience is taken, that his opposition to the view that law is a matter of logic was reserved for the position that logic is the only force at work in the development of the law. He wasn't uh, advancing a reductionist view, rather he was uh, explaining, and here I think there's a clear echo of the Hobbes idea of law being a public conscience, that uh, law is a witness, an external deposit of our moral life. And Holmes says in the uh, quotation just underneath that, that even if you are ruled by arbitrary power, if the ruler wishes to rule by law, you will find that you get something better than arbitrary power. Even if every decision required the sanction of an emperor with despotic power, we should be interested nonetheless, that is, if the person is ruling by law, discovering some order, some rational explanation, and some principle of growth for the rules which he laid down. In every system, there are such explanations and principles to be found. Right. Another source of inspiration for me, although he doesn't uh, figure all that much in the book, but uh, this sentence in Italian is very important for my current project, which is trying to take some of the arguments of the book forward, is uh, a line from the great uh, Italian uh, political and legal philosopher, Norberto Bobbio. Now, if this was an English-speaking audience, I'd have to say a lot about Bobbio, but I think that people generally in this part of the world have heard about this fellow and know quite a lot about him. Uh, can't speak any language other than English, so don't get fooled by the fact that there's uh, Italian on there, but by the thought that I'm uh, fluent in Italian, because I'm far from that. But I think that uh, even if you have no Italian, you can, uh, with Portuguese, you can see that what Bobbio says there is the juridical experience is a normative experience. And um, it, part of the project of the book, and now my ongoing project, is to try to work out what it what, what it is to have a legal experience of uh, normativity, which is why I uh, look to pragmatism as uh, my source of philosophical thought, just because uh, pragmatism does focus on experience as the main basis of our uh, judgments, including our moral judgments. Right, next source of inspiration for me is uh, someone who didn't regard himself as a pragmatist, but could be regarded as a pragmatist, and this is the great uh, English, very conservative uh, philosopher, uh, Michael Oakeshott, in an essay, uh, The Rule of Law, which he wrote in 1978. And I put the date on this essay just because I think it's the same year that uh, Joseph Raz, with whom many of you might be familiar, wrote his essay on the rule of law and its virtue, perhaps the most influential essay on the rule of law that's been written in the last uh, 50 or so years. Oakeshott's essay has almost no presence in philosophy of law. In fact, he's kind of unknown to most philosophers of law. But I think uh, Oakeshott's essay, The Rule of Law, should have been the most influential essay on the rule of law written in the last 50 or 60 years. And that essay is deeply informed by Oakeshott's understanding of uh, Hobbes's uh, political and legal philosophy. 
And in that essay, Oakeshott has the following to say. He says, there's a vision of the state in terms of the rule of law, which hovers over the reflections of many so-called positivist modern jurists. And uh, when I first uh, read that line in Oakeshott, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. But uh, after uh, many years of thinking about it, I decided that there was a huge amount packed into this line. That is that even though when we think of legal positivists, we think of uh, a view, something like uh, HLA heart separation thesis, that there's no necessary connection between law and morality, that law doesn't necessarily have any moral quality to it. These are the theses that are associated with legal positivism. But uh, Oakeshott's claim there is that these positivist modern jurists are only so-called, they think of themselves as positivists, but if you look at them carefully enough, you'll see that their positivism uh, tends to vanish as they try to deal with this complex phenomenon, uh, law and the rule of law. And there is a conception of legality or the rule of law that they kind of journeying towards, but are afraid in a way to grasp uh, uh, wholeheartedly. And a large part of the argument of the book is trying to find in these positivist jurists, particularly Hart and Kelsen, just a conception of uh, the rule of law that actually moves them uh, beyond some of their positivist uh, commitments. And another line from uh, Oakeshott's essay that I find significant, when he talks about Hobbes's uh, laws of nature, mm -hmm. and Hobbes says that the science of these laws of nature is the true and only moral philosophy, Oakeshott observes in the essay that Hobbes's laws of nature, of which there are many, I think there are 19 in 14, chapters 14 and 15 of Leviathan, he says they amount to no more than an analytic breakdown of the intrinsic character of law, the jus inherent in genuine law. And uh, what I try to show in the book by largely through this long chapter on Hobbes is that it's a mistake to uh, go about the debate in philosophy of law by thinking of it as a debate that's conducted between two sides, on the one side, the natural lawyers, on the other side, the legal positivists, because any sophisticated uh, philosopher of law will have an account of law that is a kind of blend of uh, trying to uh, say why enacted law is valuable and trying to show how principles of legality or something like Hobbes's laws of nature play a role in any legal order. Right, last source of inspiration for the book is, uh, well, actually not the last because there's Kelson and maybe I'll get to Kelson right at the end of my talk if I have time. And Thomas is going to be talking about Kelson, so I do want to try to get to him. So second last source of inspiration is HLA Hart. In uh, the introduction to the book, I say that when uh, this book is a, a kind of homage to Hart. And uh, one of the reviewers of the book, not someone who reviewed the book uh, after it appeared, but who reviewed the book when I submitted uh, the manuscript to the press, said this is a crazy claim because I'm so critical of Hart in the book that how can one consider this book to be a homage to Hart? But I point out that uh, if there's any book that I've read more than 60 or 70 times, it's probably Hart's concept of law. It's uh, been a major source of inspiration for me. And I find things in it that uh, Hart maybe would not have recognized. I have some severe criticisms of Hart to make, mostly in respect of his uh, views on Kelson, because I think uh, Hart borrowed a lot from Kelson, pretended that it was his own, and then said very disparaging things about Kelson in order to hide what he had uh, taken. But nevertheless, I think there's a huge amount uh, that one can get that's productive out of Hart. And part of the uh, plan for the book was in a way to disinter, Ooh. to uh, bring him out from where he's under, from where he's been buried under, which is uh, the work of his great student, uh, Joseph Rares. Because uh, Hart's work has been kind of eclipsed by the work of his student. And I think we should go back to Hart if we want to make progress in uh, philosophy of law. I'm happy to talk more about this uh, later if people want me to. So Hart, as I think many of you will know now, in uh, 1958, in his essay, Positivism and the Separation of Law and Morals, comes out with this famous line, uh, a line which is critical of his, his positivist predecessors. He says, law surely is not the gunman situation writ large, 
and legal order is surely not to be thus simply identified with compulsion. So there he's arguing against his positivist predecessors who he sees as having identified law with compulsion. They neglected to take account of the authoritative dimension of law, that law is not the gunman situation at large. And Hart wants to move away from that picture. And here we have the picture he's trying to uh, move away from. So this will be familiar to you from uh, the course. So we have the command model of law. What does the command model of law say? This is John Austin's 19th century legal positivism. Law is the commands of a legally unlimited sovereign who's obeyed by the bulk of the population. The bulk of the population have a habit of obedience. The commands are generally in form and they motivate obedience by threatening sanctions or punishment for non-compliance. And Austin seems to say, that's all you need to know about law is that law is a system of commands of this uh, nature. Actually, Austin was a much more sophisticated legal theorist than Hart lets on. And part of what I'm working on now is trying to uh, show just how profound Austin was as a legal theorist. And on the other side of the slide, we have a very simple picture of the command model of law. You have a sovereign who issues commands, laws, the, those are the arrows to uh, the subjects at the bottom. And then you have a bunch of officials who are enforcers who will uh, see to it that the subjects get punished if they don't comply with the law. Why doesn't Hart think that this picture works? Well, it doesn't work for the reason that was in the slide two slides ago, that we have to understand law as a matter of authority. But there's another reason, which is in the long quotation on uh, the side of the slide. And that is Hart says that in any uh, legal society, you will find that the sovereign the commander is not uncommanded. In order to make law, the sovereign is going to have to comply with uh, rules that condition uh, the making of law. And as again, I'm sure everyone here will know, Hart in 1961 gives uh, this move that he makes against Austin in 1958 a title. He calls it the rule of recognition. In every legal society, subjects have to have a way of knowing what counts as law and what does not. And one can depict a very simple rule of recognition as I have in uh, the picture. You, know, you imagine a sovereign, a, a king who make, wants to make law uh, known to uh, the sovereign subjects and makes the law known by writing the laws down on a notice board in the town square. So the notice board is the rule of recognition. How do you recognize what's law and what's not in your society? You go and look at the notice board. So there we have Hart's main move away from Austin. When uh, Lon Fuller, uh, the American legal theorist, responded uh, to Hart in his uh, book, The Morality of Law, he tried to show how much more complicated we have to make our picture of law than the picture I had up on uh, the uh, slide a moment ago. Because Fuller argues against Hart that not only will uh, the sovereign, the ultimate law giver in any society have to comply with something like a rule of recognition in order to make law. There are also principles of legality, formal principles of legality with which any lawmaker is going to have to comply if that lawmaker is going to succeed in governing by law. Laws have to be general. Promulgation is just the rule of recognition. Generally uh, non-retroactive, they have to be clear, non-contradictory. One has to be capable of complying with them and so on. And Fuller claims that if all of this is in place, these formal principles of legality, then we'll get something which he called uh, the inner morality of law or the bond of reciprocity. And uh, late in this book, The Morality of Law, he makes the claim that every departure from the principles of the law's inner morality is an affront to man's dignity as a responsible agent. So put uh, differently, if you have in place principles of legality, and by and large, uh, the people who hold political power in a society are governing in accordance with those principles of legality, then legal subjects will be treated with dignity as a responsible agent. And we can see what happens when uh, those who hold political power depart from these uh, principles, there will be an affront to man's dignity as a responsible agent. And that's precisely the claim 
that legal positivists want to deny. And here's Hart's uh, denial of the claim. Uh, this is in the 1958 piece, Health Positive and the Separation of Law and Morality, but uh, it anticipates Fuller's uh, Law and Morality book. And in fact, that whole essay, I think, uh, in 1958, is a response to Fuller. Hart's claim here, I'm not going to read this uh, wonderful quotation to you can have a look at it uh, while I talk, is that you can put in place all that Fuller suggests should be put in place, like uh, principles of legality, and still you can have what I called in my early work a wicked legal system, because uh, rulers can make law which has a wicked content and be perfectly compliant with legality. And here we have a picture of uh, such a law. This picture comes from uh, the legal order where I grew up, apartheid South Africa. This, this is a, a beach sign which was common in South Africa. At the top, it says white persons only. This beach and the amenities thereof have been reserved for white persons only. And then it just says the same thing in Afrikaans underneath. And, and Hart's claim in uh, this quotation about pedantic impartiality is, well, here you have a law it's perfectly clear when officials enforce that law, when judges interpret the law, they'll know exactly what to do. And all that will do is perpetuate the moral badness of that law. So the principles of legality make uh, no difference to the moral quality of uh, the law. So now we get my attempt to uh, show the whole of philosophy of law in uh, the debate in philosophy of law in one slide. And... Uh, on the one side, we have what I call rule of law state one, which is Hart, because Hart and then uh, Raz in this essay, I mentioned uh, the rule of law and its virtue, say to, in response to Fuller, well, Fuller, you've very nicely set out these principles of legality. We can have those principles of legality in place, but they will make no moral difference. So you have the sovereign. The so Notice how much more complicated this picture has become from my picture of Hart's rule of recognition. Uh, just a few slides ago, where all you have is the notice board in the town square as the rule of recognition. We still have that. We still have the rule of recognition. But now we have the sovereign making, putting law on the notice board in accordance with the formal principles. So that, that makes it possible for subjects to follow the law. What's more, we introduce judges to the picture. And we introduce uh, in between uh, the law and the notice board and the subjects procedural principles. So that when uh, subjects uh, find themselves uh, affected by an official decision, they can go to an independent official, uh, of the uh, independent from the official who made the decision, a judge, and say, uh, when the official who made the decision made it, was that official acting impartially? Did I get a proper hearing? Was it made? Was the decision made fairly? Was all the evidence taken into account? So all of that goes into the picture, right? So suddenly you get you get a lot of what one might think of as rule of law furniture in the positivist uh, understanding of law, and positivists seem uh, fine with that. And what's more, what we get around uh, the uh, legal space is a, th a, th a thick line, right? So th th everything that the, uh, those who wield political power uh, do to subjects, especially when they wield coercive power, has to be done according to law. They have to be able to show a legal warrant or a legal basis for their decision. So you have uh, not only rule by law, you have the rule of law, but the rule of law, so the positivists generally claim, makes no moral difference. And it's this issue of moral difference that I think is uh, at the center of the debate in philosophy of law. And if you move to the other side of the slide, which is uh, rule of law state two fuller, the only thing that's present in the other slide is Fuller's bond of reciprocity. Fuller's claim that uh, if you put all of that rule of law furniture in place, that will establish some kind of bond between the ultimate lawmaker and subjects, such that the subjects will be treated with dignity as responsible agents. That's the debate in philosophy of law reduced to two uh, pictures. So how do I go about... Uh, trying to take this debate forward. The uh, key, I think, comes in chapter five of my book, where I spend a lot of time talking about a book that was uh, written in uh, German 
in the late 1930s and then published in the United States in uh, the early 1940s and is now making a big uh, comeback as people worry about the dark times uh, for the rule of law. So, so this, this is a book written by a uh, German Jewish socialist lawyer uh, called Ernst Frankel. And uh, I wanted to emphasize the uh, Jewish socialist uh, law bit because uh, Frankel managed to practice law in Berlin between 1933 and uh, 1938. He was allowed to stay in the profession when uh, Jews had been kicked out of the profession by a 1933 uh, Nazi law, the law euphemistically called uh, the law for the restoration of the civil service. Just like uh, the apartheid state, the Nazis were great at coming up with wonderful titles for uh, terrible laws. And uh, But Frankel had served in uh, the German military in the First World War, so he got an exemption from being kicked out of uh, the uh, legal profession. So he practiced law, and uh, this book, uh, The Dual State, is a reflection on the Nazi state informed by his years of practice as a lawyer in Berlin until things got so difficult for him that he left Germany and went to the United States. So Frankel said that if you wanted to understand the Nazi state, you had to understand it as two states side by side. On the one side, you have the normative state, which was what was left over from the Weimar era. And, that, that, and there you had uh, statutes, you had criminal law, you had judges, you had trials. So everything seemed to function more or less as, as it had during the Weimar period. But side by side with that, you had uh, the prerogative state. And in the prerogative state, Nazi officials did whatever they thought was uh, necessary to carry out uh, the will of uh, the Fuhrer to make things work in the interests of the Nazi party. They could make any decision they wanted, including reaching into the normative state and extracting a matter from the normative state and dealing with it in the prerogative state or overruling a decision in the, prerogative, in the normative state. And Frankel said that as a result, there was no rule of law in Germany. Why? Because any decision made in the normative state was subject to overrule or by preemption by officials in uh, the uh, prerogative state. And th the reason why uh, there's now a second edition of Frankel's book just out from Oxford University Press and a lot of writing on Frankel is that people looking at the world around them, especially lawyers in Hong Kong, uh, see the prerogative state everywhere and the dual state everywhere. And this is of real concern to them. On, on the one side of uh, the slide, there's just the memorial tablet in Berlin uh, for Frankel. What I want to focus on is the quotation, which comes from uh, an introduction to one of the German editions of the book, where Frankel says that in the final phase of my legal practice, I frequently describe my work to friends as that of a switchman. And what he means by that is a railway switchman, you know, the, the, the fellow who sits in the railway station like a, a flight controller and sees that trains don't collide by switching one train from one track to another so that trains can pass each other safely. And that is, he says, I regarded it as an essential part of my efforts to ensure that a given case was dealt with under the auspices of the normative state and not end up in the prerogative state. So Frankel couldn't count on any matter that he was dealing with as a lawyer being settled by law. He had to try to keep things on the legal track in order for that matter to be settled by law. And so I think one can make the claim that people in some sense had no legal rights in Germany. Why? Because if a Nazi official in the prerogative state took an interest in your case, they could just take that matter and deal with it as uh, they thought best in the interests of uh, the Nazi party. So one can make the claim that there was no legal order in Germany, no rule of law, and uh, no legal rights. And that's, I think, is very important because then I think one can see why if one strips away elements of uh, the rule of law state, people will not be treated with dignity as responsible agents. And that's why, just to go back in the slide, I have the sovereign located in the prerogative state. And while it might be a little bit difficult to see, there's a broken line around the prerogative state and in between the prerogative state and the normative state. Why? Because there isn't that uh, guarantee that when an official makes a decision, there will be a legal basis or a legal warrant for the decision. Right, 
So now I want to spend a bit of time talking about uh, two other kinds of states. So we've had rule of law state, we've had uh, the dual state, and now we get uh, the state where I first started to think about the law, uh, the apartheid state. So here on the one side, we have the cover of my uh, first book in its second edition, Hard Cases in Wicked Legal Systems, Pathologies of Legality. And there I looked, as uh, Arthur uh, mentioned, at uh, the way that judges decided matters in apartheid uh, South Africa and tried to work out the implications uh, of those decisions, if any, for philosophy of law. I found uh, such implications, but these were not implications that any legal positivist, including one of my supervisors, Joseph Raz, uh, thought that uh, looking at practices of adjudication could have for philosophy of law. When I used to have supervisions with uh, Joseph Raz, he used to tell me at the end of every supervision, your thesis cannot work. Why? Because you cannot argue from practices of adjudication to philosophy of law, because all philosophy of law has to say about adjudication is that their judges are exercising discretion. Anyway, happy to talk about that in uh, the Q&A if uh, you want to. But I just want to spend a bit of time talking about the apartheid state because the apartheid state worked in a very particular way. So in the apartheid state, what you had on my understanding of uh, that state is that you did have the general legal framework. Every official decision uh, had to have a legal warrant for it. What's more, you had uh, general principles that applied to every South African. So you had principles of legality that applied to every South African. Every South African, including the black majority, was formally speaking equal under law. But what the apartheid laws did uh, amounted to two things. One is that the uh, racial laws or racist laws, if you like, carved out vast areas that were exceptions to the, the general principles. So that uh, uh, the majority black South Africans lived in the space of second class citizenship, but they were subject to these general norms at the same time. And that created a kind of tension throughout uh, the period of apartheid in the law. And it did allow for a certain kind of human rights lawing to take place one could use legal resources to be found in the law to contest the implementation of the law by the officials of the apartheid state. It was also the case that there were these security laws that uh, dealt with and actually tried to stamp out any political opposition to the state. And these security laws, they got more draconian over time until eventually they created a kind of prerogative space within the general legal framework. But this still wasn't a prerogative state side by side with the uh, normative state, as we saw in Nazi Germany, it was still the case that a certain kind of human rights lawyering was possible in order to contest, uh, say, detention decisions. Sometimes barely contest those decisions, but still uh, possible. So that's the apartheid state. Everyone is subject to the same general norms, but then you have particular statute laws that carve out vast exceptions to these general norms. Right, I'm now about to talk about my last kind of state. And uh, ordinarily, I wouldn't uh, preface this with the kind of introduction I'm going to give you now, but I'm going to preface this with an introduction, not an introduction I've ever given in any public talk. So I'm now going to be talking about Israel and the occupied territories. And of course, talking about Israel and the occupied territories is talking about uh, the situation in the Middle East at perhaps the most fraught time uh, in, in many years. So, so let me say, just as a kind of personal statement before I, I launch into this. You know, I, I, I've been in a, a state of emotional turmoil ever since uh, the Hamas set of atrocities, as I think of them. I am Jewish. I come from a family on one side of Holocaust survivors. Uh, sorry, on the other side, a family of uh, refugees from uh, pogroms in uh, Eastern Europe. And so when uh, people are being uh, killed and other terrible things are being done to them, just because they're Jewish, it affects me deeply. In, uh, and uh, that's one reason for uh, my turmoil of the last few weeks. But an another reason for my turmoil is uh, that as uh, a left-wing uh, Jewish American said in a podcast I listened to uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, he said, uh, it's profoundly un-Jewish to make anyone a refugee. And when I look at what's happening uh, in the Israeli onslaught uh, in uh, in uh, Gaza, I am just as distressed about that, maybe more distressed uh, 
than I am by what happened uh, in the Hamas attack. So I just wanted to make that uh, clear at the beginning. So sorry for inflicting this on you. I wouldn't really wouldn't have uh, done something like this. But uh, I think it's just very difficult to talk about uh, these issues at this time. So I just wanted to tell you where I stand. And perhaps just what, one more thing. You, you might be aware that when the Secretary General of the United States uh, made a statement a few weeks ago, he got into terrible trouble from the Israeli ambassador. And I think maybe he didn't uh, word his statement in the most uh, politically astute way. But what he said in that statement was there are terrible things happening but we have to keep an eye on the general situation because if we don't actually look at the general situation, uh, we're never going to uh, be able to do anything productive. To focus on is my understanding of uh, the more general things in uh, this part of the world. So my inspiration here is uh, so something appeared on my screen, but it's gone now and it's not on yours is uh, the work of uh, an Israeli uh, human rights lawyer who does nearly all of his work in the occupied territories, a Jewish Israeli called uh, Michael Sward. I talked about him, I don't know whether you remember this, all those years ago when I talked about lawyering and the rule of law in, uh, in hard times. And, and Sward has a book which has had a huge influence on me uh, in the last few years. It's called The Wall and the Gate, Israel, Palestine, and the Legal Battle for Human Rights. And there, although you can barely see him, he's reduced to very small. You can see Michael Sward standing against the, the wall that separates uh, Palestinians, other than Palestinian citizens of Israel, from uh, Israel. And just so that you can get a sense of uh, the wall, there's the wall. It's often referred to as a fence or a separation barrier, but it's actually something much more uh, dramatic than that, as you can uh, see from this uh, photo. So this book of uh, Sward's, is about the dilemmas of being a human rights lawyer uh, operating in a system which you regard as horribly unjust and horribly oppressive. And actually, if you speak to human rights lawyers anywhere, you will usually find that they have this view of their legal order. There's, of course, some are worse than others, but no human rights lawyer thinks of the legal order against which uh, uh, they're struggling as, uh, as just or un unoppressive. And what Swad tries to deal with in this book is what I call, or maybe he calls, uh, the paradox of human rights lawyering. That human rights lawyers have to struggle with the fact that winning lots of legal victories may not only not affect the bad regime, but even serve to legitimize it. And that, I think, is a very interesting insight. And uh, another interesting insight from the Swad book is that if you're going to go to court and argue to judges, you have to accept from the beginning that the judges will think that their regime is legitimate. You can't tell the judges, I'm going to argue to you that uh, the whole regime is illegitimate because they will just not entertain that kind of argument. So you have to make arguments within the kind of language game that's accepted by the judges, which limits the kinds of arguments you can make, which is why uh, Swad and other human rights lawyers struggle with these dilemmas because they're, they're they recognize that they're operating in a very limited space. And what's more, that their operation within that limited space serves to legitimize the very regime that they're struggling against. Why is that the case? Swart tells us something very interesting about what his view about legal norms. He says that legal norms justify. For the most part, we obey statute law and case law, not just because they come with mechanisms for enforcement. It's not just the gunman situation writ large but because we accept that following them is the right thing to do. We accept for the most part that a norm established through the prevailing constitutional order is justified. A legal norm is at one at the same time an is and an ought. So now we get uh, a quick picture of uh, the parallel state. So this is an attempt to reduce a very complex legal situation uh, to uh, a simple picture. And what happens in the parallel state is you have Israel on one side, the occupied territories on the other, uh, and uh, the occupied territories are, I don't think uh, today, given what's happening there, uh, generally governed by law, and not only by law, but also by international law, and to some extent, uh, Israeli constitutional law. But the Israeli Supreme Court has seen over time uh, a way of filtering these norms through administrative law which means that the Palestinians have very diminished uh, public law rights. And yet they live 
uh, cheek by jowl, if you're familiar with this uh, English expression, their, their direct neighbors are uh, the settlers who have full constitutional rights uh, under uh, uh, Israeli law and are protected by uh, the army. So th they are second class citizens, or maybe worse, uh, in, in this space. But still I make the claim that they're not living in an apartheid state. This is a different sort of state. It's uh, a parallel state. So just to be clear here, the claim that they don't live in an apartheid state is a, a very limited claim because the, it's limited to the point that unlike South Africa, Palestinians do not live subject to the general norms that in principle govern the lives of all South Africans. They're not subject to those general norms. Only the settlers are. That is not to say that they're not subject to an apartheid regime because on my legal philosophical understanding of what's going on in Israel, uh, there's a difference between being subject to the crime of apartheid and being subject to the law of an apartheid state because to be in an apartheid state, everyone has to be subject to the same general norms and that's not the case with uh, the parallel state. Now note this is different from uh, the apartheid state in the respect I just mentioned. There were attempts at times to turn the apartheid state into a parallel state by setting up homelands where uh, the black majority would be parceled out into these different uh, really uninhabitable areas of South Africa and they would get some kind of uh, self-government and then they would be ruled by a different law by the law of uh, their government. But the apartheid state never succeeded in establishing a parallel state so that's one option that uh, one can take in order to uh, avoid the tensions that arise within an apartheid state, you can try to turn your state into a parallel state. Another option, which was partly taken, as I tried to depict in my picture of the apartheid state, is to turn the state into a dual state so that you have a prerogative state side by side with a normative state, in which case, as I said before, you have no rule of law, no legal rights, etc. And I think if one puts all of that together, one can see why Fuller's bond of reciprocity is established as long as you have the rule of law in place, because as soon as you move away from the rule of law, uh, you create different kinds of tensions. And uh, the worst kind of tension is the tension that's created when you uh, put in place a dual state, because then you no longer have the rule of law at all. But if you have a parallel state or if you have an apartheid state, there will be tensions that arise within the legal order the kinds of tensions with which uh, human rights lawyers uh, can uh, productively work. And uh, so I find uh, this category very interesting that I mentioned earlier of the second class citizen, because the second class citizen is someone who uh, is discriminated against, but because that person is at the same time subject to uh, the general norms of the legal order, that's what creates the tensions within the legal order and it's with those tensions that human rights lawyers uh, can uh, work. And I say there, perhaps controversially, that this kind of second class status is much more legally problematic than the status of slavery, so long as the enslaved persons are relentlessly consigned to the status of objects or things. So this isn't a claim about what's morally problematic, because I think it's much more morally problematic to enslave people than to treat them as second class citizens. But if you succeed, which is actually quite difficult to do in totally enslaving part of your population through law, then the enslaved population has no more rights than my pen has rights. And so they're no longer persons, they, so they can't be second class uh, citizens. And so this, this, the, being a second class citizen is much more legally problematic than being an enslaved person. Why? Because a slave person, enslaved person is not subject to law at all, or at least only subject to law in the same way that my pen is somewhat regulated by law in that if you take my pen away from me forcibly, uh, you'll get into trouble. Right, finally, I'm afraid I have used up almost an hour, we get to Kelson. And uh, why does Kelson uh, figure in my book? Well, I'm actually going to leave it to Thomas to say more about uh, Kelson. But I think uh, the two of us share the view that if one looks at parts of Kelson that uh, most Kelson scholars uh, neglect, and that most people who know very little about Kelson, which is most philosophers of law in the English-speaking world, you find a very different Kelson emerging, especially if you look at the way that he understood the relationship 
between uh, international law and uh, state law. Because there, Kelsen is quite clear that uh, his basic norm has to be understood as a postulate of peace. And if one goes back to his uh, 1920 book on sovereignty, one gets this very interesting claim uh, in Kelsen, which I'm not going to read to you, it, it takes too long. But he says uh, that uh, the, the, the juristic hypothesis that there is this basic norm and that above the communities understood as states stands a legal order which delimits the spheres of validity of the individual states in that it hinders incursions by one into the sphere of the others is a, an idea, and I forgot to put this on the slide, which he says is the highest ethical idea. So he links quite clearly in his work the, postulate, the basic norm with the postulate of peace and makes it clear that he thinks of this as an ethical idea. And I think one can uh, take this kind of quotation about uh, the relationship between international law and state law and transpose it to uh, state law and say that if one has in place uh, the furniture of a legal order, united as uh, Kelsen thought by an idea like the basic norm, then you will find that uh, you, uh, individuals within that state are able to interact with each other on equal terms under peaceful conditions. So now I'm going to turn it over to you. I think I've uh, said enough. Okay, so before uh, I begin, I want to read a quote from the working that I looked up while David was speaking, because it's one of my favorite uh, quotes. Uh, usually the working says the most important things towards the end of whatever he's, ri he's writing. And he said something uh, in his heart lecture, which everyone will know th th that lecture. Uh, heart and, and the postscript that, that appears in chapter six of uh, Justice in Robes. And I quite like what he says. Um, on occasion like this, occasion, it is hard to resist speaking directly to young scholars who have not yet joined a doctrinal army. So I clo close with this appeal to those of you who plan to take up legal philosophy. When you do take up a legal philosophy, uh, when you do, take up philosophy's rightful burdens and abandon the cloak of neutrality. And I think that this is very important. And I think that there are many reasons to admire a, a philosopher. Uh, one of them is their skills, their competence. But the other one is their awareness of, of what they are doing. They, they are discussing things that matter to each and one of us. And I think that David is one of these persons. And I thank you for doing this, David. Because... People like us here in Brazil too, but uh, perhaps other peoples need more than we do now in Israel or the Palestinians. But we need that kind of scholarship. We need uh, uh, commitment and, and, and that kind of political responsibility. It's part, I believe that it is part of the responsibility of scholars to, to use their knowledge to discuss real problems that our world uh, is, is facing now. Thank you for doing this. That's one of the reasons of why I admire you so much. Okay, so this is my my paper. I can close now my computer. And use, oh no, no okay. I just need to put this uh, this mic here. Can you can you see everything? I think I need to move a little bit to the to the center. Okay, so this is the. Yeah, maybe this. Yeah, I can go that. So this is the, 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 oops, it's moving too fast. On Dyson Hall's loss, loss laboratory metaphor, a further and very specific comment on the long arc of legality. Um, further, because I've written before about the long arc of legality. I, I wrote a very early review when the book came out, and then I used part of it in other uh, writings that I have done, especially on, on the relationship between national law and international law. I've used some of, of, of David's work for that, but I have never discussed it, uh, even though I have written about pragmatism extensively, I have never discussed uh, David's view on, on pragmatism, which I apologize for that, David. I just I just wrote a, a long piece on, on two versions of legal pragmatism where I discussed fish and working, and I do not mention David. So I, I came back to the book because, because there are so many things in the book. 
that I've read and I can prove that I read that I read every sentence because I, I got my copy here and it's completely scratched and I made notes in every single page of the book. Uh, I, I, I skipped that that bit and now I am I am taking this opportunity to discuss it. So in a relatively known paper published a few years before the first edition of the Pure Theory of Law. Kelsen makes an interesting reply to the claim that the idea of equality and the principle sum quicket rivery provides a justification for natural law and a counter argument for legal positivism separability thesis. Here's a fragment of the argument. And Kelsen says basically that the principle of equality in law means uh, only that the law will be applied in, in a logical, consistent way. So it, it doesn't matter. It, it's not a substantive principle. Okay. And I skip the quote. One should not underestimate, however, oops, it's too fast. Uh, okay. Uh, the interpretive role of the idea of equality under law in Kelsen's jurisprudence. Since, since Kelsen defends a special form of legal positivism, which he classifies as a critical positivism, the key to understand Kelsen's methodological stance lies not in the noun positivism, but rather in the adjective critical. Here's a longer statement of Kelsen's methodological point about critical positivism. It, and, and I quote Kelsen. It has been already pointed out that it is the function of the basic norm, not only to recognize a historically given material as law, but also to comprehend it as a meaningful order. It must be frankly admitted uh, that such an accomplishment would not be possible by means of pure positivism, that is, merely by means of a dynamic principle of delegation as expressed in the basic norm of positive law. And I, I just go down a little bit because I do not read want to read the whole the whole quote. It says um, that his his theory of law, the pure theory of law, in this last sentence of the quote, it is preferable to call it a, a, a critical positivism instead of merely a positivism. And the, the word critical here is used in a Kantian sense. Okay, so uh, that in the sense that we must make make sense of, of, of the law by means of, of, of some presuppositions that we need to make it a meaningful and intelligible order, a, a unified account, okay, that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to um, attach to our previous knowledge of everything else that we know, okay. So part of, part of Dysonhaus ambitions in, in the long arc of legality where he endorses a Kelsenian account of legality and the rule of law is to retain and explore in greater detail the practical entailments of the idea that legal cognition and interpretation is a critical endeavor in Kelsen's, Kelsen's Kantian sense. Dysonhaus reasoning in sections 2.2 of the book, where the metaphor of law's laboratory is introduced, is particularly successful in presenting this point. The thought that the thought that law is a laboratory for testing moral views is a form of legal and moral pragmatism, as one can read in the following uh, paragraph. And uh, I will skip the quote. If, moral, if a moral pragmatism of this kind is granted, Dyson Halls is happy to accept Dworkin's idea that to understand the law, one must make it the best it can be by interpreting it in its moral light. He argues that if Peirce's pragmatic account of truth and inquiry is correct, then, I quote, true and rational beliefs in any field of inquiry are those which survive the tribunal of experience and argument against the background of our current beliefs and principles. As a consequence, the set, settled beliefs arising from this process of inquiry are always provisional since they must be left vulnerable to revision in light of further of, Further experience, and I and I end the quote. Dyson Hall presupposes this type of moral pragmatism in a crucial step of this argument, where he endorses Honoré's point that uh, law seeks to supplant unregulated violence, both within societies and between them, by fostering values of cooperation and peaceful existence. End of quote. No one can understand the law, Honoré argues, without resorting to critical morality to which the lawmaker implicitly appeals. Dyson Hall's implicit morality is both pragmatic and critic, 
and it is connected with the law through a symbiotic relationship that is explained in the following way. I will skip the parts in, in red of, of, of the paper. For there is a symbiotic relationship between inside and the outside of the law of a modern legal state, one which is juridically required by Kelsenian international law monism when it comes to public and private international law, and which is not merely formal since morality and law have the same minimum content. That's the end of, of, of the citation. The assumption that law and morality have the same minimum content is not trivial, just like the principle of equality in the eyes of law is not. It establishes at least a common starting point from which one can acquit one's intellectual responsibility to understand the law critically and requires one to treat the law as a rational enterprise. This critical attitude is at the core of Kelsen's assumption that we need the basic norm to turn to the body of legal materials, documents, historical decisions into a meaningful order. We need the, the Kelsen requires the, the, the basic norm to transform those materials into something meaningful. Um, Dyson Halls probably found more connections between moral pragmatism and Kelsen's critical positivism than any other scholars in, in, scholar in contemporary jurisprudence, jurisprudence has ever found. He adopts a charitable reading, not only of Kelsen's dynamic account of legal reasoning and, and interpretation, but also of Holmes' predictive theory of law and Fuller's account of the internal morality of law. The idea of prediction in Holmes' theory, for instance, is interpreted as committed not only to the American tradition of legal realism, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to a non-reductionist account about law and morality, which takes very seriously the law's em embodiment of moral experience and implicit norms. To predict what will be treated as, as a legal duty, one should be inter interested in, I quote, discovering some order, some rational you know, explanation and some principles of growth for the rules that a given authority entrenches in that system. As Holmes puts it in a fragment eloquently cited by Dyson Halls in a crucial passage of the book. I think he showed that quote uh, in today's talk too. Uh, when Dyson Halls argues for a symbiotic relationship between law and morality, he explicitly relies on this idea and maintains that while the law is viewed dynamically, it must be interpreted as, a, as critically responsive to the moral experience of a given community, as explained in another quote. Uh, consider, and I quote David here, consider this in light of the role of law in 19th century Britain consigning women to a second class status. In order to have the second class status, recall, one has to have one foot in the first class, class space, the other foot in the discriminatory space. Thus, those bits of the law which recognized women's formal equality made problematic the bits which did not. And this inconsistency is the engine of, of, of David's argument throughout the whole book. Okay, an important point about uh, Dyson's book is the thought that law provides the resources for its own self-criticism, or the ingredients for its own self-correction through a critical in interpretative reassessment in, uh, I quote, laboratory for testing moral ideas, because of the law's self-critical attitude and because of its responsiveness to moral experience and to rational reconstructions of that experience, Dyson concludes that, I quote, the kinds of social prejudices which help maintain a group in a second class status might wither in the fate of the experience made available when the law helps to begin to bring that group into a condition of equality. Such changes comes about be because the law because the positive law of any legal order is always saturated with the morality of the society in which uh, that order is located, end of, of quote. Dyson Hodes is aware that to uphold this view, he must be very careful to specify the kind of morality he has in mind. Hence, his advocacy of a symbiotic connection between law and morality is choose any form of moral realism the theory that moral judgments reflect certain objective, fact, objective sorry, facts in the moral world, and any version of moral emotivism 
that amounts to expressions of changing human attitudes, choices, demands, or feelings. He thinks, in fact, that rejecting these two accounts of morality is the most important lesson we can learn from Hart on the nature of social practice and morality. Although Hart himself failed to acknowledge the problems of the separability thesis and of a static theory of legal knowledge. Nonetheless, my point is not to discuss Dysonhaus's insight, insightful critique of Hart, but merely to make sense of the metaphor of Law's laboratory and make explicit some commitments that this proposal entails. The metaphor of, of Law's laboratory, if correct, leads us to conceive Kelsen as a legal pragmatist. As I argued in a very short review of Dysonhaus's book, this pragmatic interpretation of Kelsen may appear to some readers unorthodox and distant from Kelsen's original insights. And perhaps there is some grain of truth in this criticism. I want to discuss here two apparent difficulties that Dysonhall faces um, in his account of legality and his interpretation of Kelsen. First, a doubt whether the morality that we must accept under, under Kelsen's jurisprudence can be safely classified as a form of pragmatism. And second, an implication of Dysonhall's defense of a strong reading of authority in Kelsen's pure theory of law. I must confess that I added the second uh, problem after our discussion over dinner last night. Uh, so uh, I, will, I, I did not make any quotes, just one page at the end to discuss this, this second point, okay? So the first one is Kelsen and Kant on law, morality, and pragmatism. The first difficulty is that it is not evident that Kelsen's jurisprudence can be safely reinterpreted as a form of philosophical pragmatism, either about law or morality. Kelsen's explanation of the critical character of legal, in legal inquiry, the, the very long quote that I skipped, okay, uh, resorts to Kant's epistemology. And if Kelsen's account of legal cognition qualifies as a form of pragma philosophical pragmatism, the same conclusion will apply to Kant. Can Kelsen and Kant be safely described as committed regardless of what they say or what others say uh, about it? as committed to philosophical pragmatism? That, that, that's, that's the question that I want to answer. I think that the answer depends on what we think, or on what we take pragmatism to mean. As I argued in previous work, which I will paraphrase in the rest of this section, that's my paper on fish and working, okay? We can answer this question with a distinction presented by Robert Brandon between two senses of philosophical pragmatism, namely a narrow version that can be described as a philosophical school centered on evaluating beliefs by their tendency to promote success at, success, at the satisfaction of wants, and a broad or extended version that can be classified as a movement centered on the primacy of the practical. Let us begin with the, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Brandon explained the difference between these two versions of, of philosophical pragmatism through five pragmatic commitments, four of which are chaired by the two versions and one of which is endorsed only by the narrow version of, of pragmatism. Okay, let us begin with the four commitments uh, that the narrow and the broader version of pragmatism share. So the first commitment uh, and the most basic is the one that Brendel calls a methodological pragmatism. That is the thought that the point about semantics is defined by the pragmatic use we make of the concept a semantic theory purports to explain. To be a pragmatist in the methodological sense is to conceive semantics as answering to pragmatics in the sense that the pragmatic theory supplies the explanatory target of a semantic theory, and hence is the ultimate source of the criteria of adequacy according to which the success of that theoretical enterprise is to be assessed. That's a very mysterious quote, especially because I skipped the footnote and I skipped the red part. But what, what Brandon is saying is that um, the meaning will, 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 will the target will, uh, will be provided by, by, by the pragmatics. Okay, so we need to respond to a pragmatic necessity in order to build a, a semantic theory, a theory of meaning, 
in general. The second commitment is a semantic practice. Don't worry about the first and the second. If you don't understand, it doesn't make any difference. What matters is the third and the fourth and the fifth commitments, okay? Uh, so this one, if you don't understand, it doesn't matter, okay? The second commitment is, is a semantic pragmatism. That is the assumption uh, endorsed by, by the philosophy that developed under the influence of Wittgenstein, that the point of departure of any semantic analysis must be the way the practitioners use expressions that make them mean what they do. That's the, the I can sp skip the rest because that's the, the, the more familiar uh, Wittgenstein and reason why people say Wittgenstein was a pragmatist, okay? So let, let's move to the third commitment. The third commitment is what Brandon calls a fundamental pragmatism. That is the thought that knowing how has an explanatory priority over knowing that. The only way to render explicit conceptual content, concepts intelligible, whatever concept, okay, Brandon affirms, is against a background of implicit practical abilities. The driving force of this pragmatic commitment is an objection to Platonist intellectualism, which substitutes the appeal to the first principles or idealistic values by the thought that the responsibilities of a rational agent can be described as tasks responsibilities to take something meaningful, commits to the ascription of meaning one does by using a concept and attribute to the hearer um, an entitlement to use that concept in the same way. I have discussed this third pragmatist commitment in the context of the debate between Stanley Fish and Ronald Dworkin in the following way. As much as I like uh, the Fish Dworkin debate, I will skip part of my own uh, departing bread, the, 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 the rest of the quote I said. Since Fish and Dworkin are fundamental pragmatists. They both believe that the content of the law is not determined through, through a correspondence theory of truth that acknowledges a practice independent meaning detained by the text itself. They define interpretation as a practical capacity possessed by the participants of the legal practice, which Dworkin described in an early essay as the sense of appropriateness. So probably you have read the work, so you know what this sense of appropriateness is about. This is basically a uh, fundamental pragmatism. The idea that we have some practical ability to understand uh, the, the, the concepts we apply uh, in, in our argumentative practices, okay? Perhaps a reader of this quotation will reply, but how does this practical capacity or sense of appropriateness emerge? The question brings us to the fourth commitment of philosophical pragmatism, which Brandon calls a normative pragmatism or a pragmatism about norms. A discursive capacity, a discursive social practice cannot provide a distinction between correct and incorrect applications of the explicit rules accepted by the participants without presupposing implicit norms against the background of which they must be read. So the fourth commitment is, is normative pragmatism. There are rational norms, the norms of, of rationality, epistemic norms, and norms embedded in every argumentative practice that we, we participate. The, and these norms will help us provide uh, a, a criterion to distinguish between correct and incorrect in interpretations. So this, 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 this embedded rationality, structural rationality, we might, we might call it. Okay, so I will skip a very long session where I discuss Wittgenstein's regress arguments and the, the regularist and inferentialist uh, responses to Wittgenstein as much as I love this part. Uh, uh, and I was tempted, uh, but, but, but I think that the, the burden of generosity uh, forces me to not to to read that because I know that I'm testing your patience already by just reading this long comment, which I promise is, is, is about to end. Okay, more than 50% already. Um, what distinguishes uh, merely perceptual or sensorial behavior, which is the sort of activity of intelligent and intelligent sentient creatures from the distinctively rational uh, action of sapient creatures like us is the fact that only the latter can treat these norms, the norms of rationality, as reasons, instead of mere regularities that we repeat because of habits or natural dispositions. We act rationally and we understand correctly when we place ourselves 
under the authority of rational norms. You see, a dog can realize that uh, something itches and that if he scratches his, his body against the wall, it will stop itching. Okay, so a body, a dog can have some kind of instrumental rationality, as it were. Okay, but not the kind of of of, of practical or, or, or normative rationality that uh, uh, Brandon is is discussing here. This uh, the ability to treat something as a reason and to understand something as a reason and to explain something as a reason is what distinguishes we from the merely sentient creatures that they are not intelligent okay okay um so we can act rationally and we can understand correctly when we place ourselves under the authority of rational norms that's the fourth pragmatist commitment and all pragmatists i argue including kant and hegel <laughs> Uh, not, I'm not saying that. Brandon is saying that. So blame him uh, if you don't like that idea. They share this this idea, but they do not share the fifth commitment, which is instrumental pragmatism. It is only when we consider the fifth pragmatic commitment described by Brandon, the 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 one accepted by the narrow or classical version of pragmatism that we can grasp the sense in which neither Kelsey nor Kant nor Dysonhouse should be described as pragmatists. They cannot be read as pragmatists in the narrow sense of the term, although it is perfectly plausible to treat them as pragmatists in the wider sense. Narrow pragmatism accepts all the four pragmatic commitments described in this previous section. First, by giving pride of place of habits, practical skills and abilities, to know how, in a broad sense, they accept fundamental pragmatists. Second, by accepting that the point of our talk about what we mean or believe is to be found in light of, in the light it sheds on what we do, on habits, uh, on our habits, practice of inquiry, of solving problems and pursuing goals, they accept methodological pragmatism. Third, by taking the meaning of our utterances and beliefs uh, must be explained in terms of the role these utterances and belief play in our habits and practice. They endorse semantic pragmatism. Fourth, by endorsing, uh, by resorting to norms implicit in practice, they attach to normative pragmatism. The difference is the kind of norms to which they resort, because narrow pragmatists focus exclusively on instrumental norms to determine what counts as a performance better or worse, correct or incorrect. Everything turns, Brandon summarizes, on the agent's success in securing some end or achieving some goal. Uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, However much we need. Uh, uh, we can keep it for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, okay, so it's fine. I, I'll be able to finish. Okay. Um, Okay, so now I quote uh, Brandon again. I say that uh, uh, this is the kind of norm they see as implicit in discursive practices. And in keeping up with their, their semantic pragmatism, uh, they, they see as the ultimate source of, of specifically semantic dimensions of normative assessments such as truth. They understand, understand truth in terms of its usefulness and take the contents possessed by intentional states as expressed by linguistic utterances that consists in their potential contribution to the success of an agent's practical enterprise. Burse, James, and Dewey are at base, though not, not always and not in every respect, instrumental normative pragmatists. One of the reasons for the classical pragmatisms subscription to instrumental norms is the apparent facility with which it imagined it, it manages to reconcile its insights on the role of implicit norms with the naturalism endorsed by its proponents. The instrumental interpretation of norms eliminates the apparent mystery of discursive practices and the attribution of a concept of conceptual content by the participants of this practice. A central feature of normal no, of narrow pragmatism is its endorsement of a previous human version of Davidson's belief desire model of rational explanations. According to this model, to give a rational explanation is to provide a causal explanation. A reason rationalizes an action, I quote uh, Davidson, uh, 
only if it leads us to see something that the agent wanted, desired, prized, held dear, thought beautiful, beneficial, obligatory, or agreeable. To end of quote. To hold that an agent acted for a reason, therefore, uh, is to characterize this action as I quote Davidson again, as having some sort of pro attitude towards this uh, towards action of a certain kind. And B, believing or knowing, perceiving, noticing, remembering that this action, I promise I didn't touch it. According to Brandon, narrow pragmatism identified true beliefs by their capacity to satisfy a desire, leading us to a semantic theory based on the pragmatic distinction between the desire being satisfied and not being satisfied. In addition, it determines when a desire is satisfied according to a self-satisfaction, of to a felt satisfaction of this. So I feel that I'm sad, that the desire is satisfied. Like an animal can recognize that something itches and then something removes the itch and satisfy its desire to stop scratching, one can hope to build a model of content attributions in that way, according to the following scheme. Desires motivate behavior and permit the sort of behavior. Uh, oops. No. And permit... Uh, and there's something and permit sorting okay sorting out distinguishing eh? between the behavior that satisfies and the behavior that does not satisfy or eliminate the desire in the context of these desires beliefs can be imputed as implicit in the behavior strategies an organism adopts to satisfy them the beliefs will concern how things are and so what effects can be expected to ensure from various sorts of performances. The success or failure of those strategies permits an assessment of the truth or falsity of the beliefs. I mentioned now three problems of, uh, three criticisms, but I will stick to one of them, okay? Uh, because otherwise I would have to read two pages so I can skip them and get read to the end of the paper. So the, the first and the most important one is that uh, the belief desire model and the instrumental instrumentalist theory of truth that we can find in early American pragmatism uh, doesn't have uh, a criterion of mistakes. So Brandon calls that the problem of incorrigibility. You can never know when you understood something incorrectly because uh, whatever, whatever successfully satisfy your desire will be taken and accepted as truth. So I, this this uh, this criticism uh, this model must fail, and it must be replaced by uh, a model that Brendel calls the inferentialism. And inferentialism presupposes two things: first, uh, a system of beliefs, like a web of, of beliefs, in quiet sense, in the sense that some of the norms and convictions and commitments can serve as checks on the others. So we can we can eliminate inconsistent beliefs. We we can we can uh, discredit some assertion when it is inconsistent with with, with what we already know. And the other uh, leg of inferentialism is the social practice. The participants they share responsibilities to one another, and they uh, every time they accept an assertion, they attribute to the hearer an entitlement to to take this assertion. As, as 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 correct and to render the the utterer or of this assertion responsible for what he says so there is this social practice which uh, sellers calls the game of giving and asking for reasons and and it is the, within the social practices that we can uh, justify and criticize assertions in a social practice so given that brief explanation i can skip the so many people to claim to be committed to pragmatism. This is a case, for instance, of legal scholars like Posner, Sunstein, the other Posner, Vermeule, pre-natural law conversion, and several others. A particularly interesting example is Stanley Fish, who criticized the working on the ground that the interpretive attitude that working requires for a proper understanding of legal concepts, namely law as integrity, is impossible not to be adopted because it should not be treated as a normative way to distinguish between correct and incorrect decisions, but rather as an automatic method of decision making that every participant in the practice of legal argumentation is already endorsing. Basically, I claim that Fish accepts the belief-desire model and the instrumental rationality. 
uh, fish incurs in the problem that Brandon has described as the problem of incorrigibility. It is important to clarify, therefore, the commitments to narrow pragmatism that leads fish and others to that mistake. Perhaps I can point out to another example that I use to explain the difference between the interpretive attitudes of the working in fish. I beg your, your pardon for the long and self-annoying and annoying self-quotation. Sorry, this time I'll have to quote uh, and the whole thing because that's my own contribution to, to this debate, okay? Fish depicts the task of justification as an add-on to a purely intuitive judgment. This amounts to a version of legal realism's argument from conclusion to premises, restating a familiar debate within that tradition about how to interpret Dewey's distinction between the logic of inquiry, the intuitive processes by which we approach an object, make it concrete and grasp it in order to find statements of general principle and particular fact, fact which are worthy as premises, and the logic of justification, which is a different thing, the backward processes by which we check our insights in light of rational principles, working from general premises to particular conclusions. So is 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 is, is going back. So the logic of, of of inquiry is when I reach an insight, and the logic of justification is when I attempt to show that this this conclusion is correct. Okay. As Gerald Postema summarized it, um, the legal, re legal, legal realists' argument from conclusion or of judicial with window dressing is characterized by the following three by the following three step processes. First, grasping and makes, making sense of the facts and arriving at a hunch concerning the right way to deal with it, the right conclusion. Second, working back from this conclusion to plausible premises to support it. And third, working in reverse down from the principles back to the conclusion, usually in the public form of a written judicial opinion. As Postuma points out, this model was interpreted inside the legal realist tra uh, tradition in different way ways, while Hutchison and Frank regarded the process as passive and unresponsive because judges really decide these cases by feeling, not by judgment or hunching, not by ratiocination, uh, such that rational justification appears only in the opinion as a persuasion strategy. Llewellyn regarded the third element as an active process of reasoning, as an in integral component of the process, not just a final unimportant stage. The activity of justification for Llewellyn provides a public check upon his, the judge's work that develops in the following way. I quote Llewellyn, why it is possible to build a number of div di divergent political ladders up up the same classes and down again up to the dispute, there are not so many that can be built defensively. In this example, it is clear that only the more plausible interpretation of the argument for, from conclusion to premises adopted by the Welling is consistent with the kind of pragmatism that Dyson Hose endorses. That's my end of this comment. And I have this very final session that I added after uh, last night's conversation with with David. Uh, Protestant interpretation as an implication of Dysonhaus' strong reading of authority in Kelsen's jurisprudence. Dysonhaus' point about law as a laboratory uh, presupposes a legal and moral pragmatism, although not a narrow or instrumental pragmatism. Dysonhaus' pragmatism is inherently rationalistic. That's important. It presupposes that every, compo every competent interpreter of the law can and should engage in a critical reconstruction of its meaning. It presupposes that no one can take the law seriously without making a judgment about what that law entails. This assumption is connected to an important thesis that Dyson Hall upholds, namely the strong reading of authority. Uh, I think it's in chapter three of, of the book. Uh, the, the legal norms, even under Kelsen's theory of law, are not prim primarily directed to officials and only indirectly aimed at citizens and persons whose conduct the norm is intended to regulate in the way that other Kelsen scholars like Stanley Paulson have interpreted the pure theory of law. Since Kelsen jurisprudence aims, aims to, I quote, uh, uh, transform might into right, as David uh, reminds us throughout the book, 
uh, then jurisprudence first question is, is, is the one that he also reminds us the whole book. But how can that be the law for me? Every citizen is always in a position to ask uh, that question and is entitled to a justified answer from every authority in every act of law application. Dysonhaus is absolutely correct about that. We could press that argument even further. We could say that we are entitled to that answer not only in our relationships with a political authority, but also in our relationships with one another in a political community. We all have the responsibility to ask and give that kind of answer every time that social relationships are at stake. Every one of us is not only entitled to make that question, but also has a responsibility to give an answer when our own conduct may have an impact on someone else's obligations and rights. It is this mutuality, and I take that from Postema's new book, uh, also, which is uh, also very interesting. Uh, it is this mutuality that keeps the practice of the rule of law standing because the rule of law requires a positive and critical engagement of every one of us. This is an important lesson that Kelsen neglects because he sometimes thinks that official interpretation is the only kind or the only one that is legally binding. When Kelsen writes about authentic interpretation at the end of the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law, he seems to think that only official interpretation is binding. On the other hand, Kelsen writes about legal science, critical knowledge, and cognition. When he writes about that, he seems to think that jurisprudence is normative and that legal scientists should adopt a quasi-Kantian interpretive approach. This idea is more plausible, but there is still, still something missing here, something that Dysonhaus's book helps us see. Dysonhaus's combination of Pragmatism and the strong reading of authority requires that everyone regards the law as a rational normative practice and thus as a game of giving and asking for reasons in Wilfried Sellers' sense. This means that Dowsenhaus's metaphor of law as a laboratory for testing moral claims implies something that working defended extensively in law's empire and everyone else in jurisprudence or perhaps almost everyone else with my own exception, uh, 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 criticized the intellectual attitude denominated Protestant interpretation. I would have a lot to say about that, given that I've written two extended papers on the topic and probably have a couple more to write in the coming years. But civility recommends me to stop this presentation now. And I'll do it by quoting a famous and important paragraph from the working with which he ends Law's Empire. Um, uh, you may think that I only read the working's last sentences because <laughs> I began by reading the last paragraph of another piece. Yeah. Uh, so law is not exhausted by any catalog of rules and principles, each, of, uh, each with its own ambition over some discrete theater of behavior, nor by any roster of officials and their powers each over part of our lives. Laws and is defined by attitudes, not territory or power of all processes. We studied that attitude in, mainly in appellate courts where it is dressed for inspection, but, but it must be, be pervasive in, in our ordinary lives. That, that's the important part. If it is to serve us well, even in court, it is an interpretive self-reflective attitude addressed to politics in the Broadway sense. It is a Protestant attitude that makes each citizen responsible for imagining what these commitments require in new circumstances. The Protestant character of law is confirmed and the creative role of private decision makers acknowledged by the backward looking judgmental nature of judicial decisions and also by the regulative assumption that though judges may have the last word, their word is not for that reason the best word. Dworkin is talking here about an intellectual attitude that is implied in Dysonhaus' strong reading of authority and should be adopted in every speech act that someone who asks Dysonhaus' first question of jurisprudence performs. And that's how I end my presentation. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, should David go back to you? That's uh, what I was going to ask. Would you like to respond to that, David? Sounds like that. 
But I think that the camera is aimed at this position. Oh, that's yeah. okay. That's it's okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's movable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So now. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to pick up on uh, something that uh, Thomas did not uh, something quote, that quote quote from his very from the very long uh, quotation at the beginning from uh, Kelson. So uh, Kelson talking about the basic norm and uh, contrasting that with natural law says that the difference between a natural law position and uh, and the his uh, basic norm understanding of legal order says it is a difference between critical philosophy as a theory of experience and subjective speculation. Yeah. So th you know, I've read this uh, this really, really book that's appended to another book several times, but I never noticed that. So I'm really grateful to see that. And I think one could connect it to something that came in the very long quotation also at the end, which you did read, where Dworkin talks about a regulative assumption. And what is a regulative assumption? It's an assumption that we adopt in order to go forward. And uh, I think this, we can safely ditch the more kind of metaphysical side of Kant and uh, and the, that bit of Kelsen and just understand Kelsen as a pragmatist. And I, I wanted to, and a pragmatist in the wide sense. Yeah. So I wanted to illustrate this by actually talking about, uh, quickly about uh, law understood as an instrument. So I, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the essay by Joseph Raz that I mentioned earlier, uh, the rule of law and its virtue. So, so Raz there takes Fuller's principles of uh, legality, actually adds a lot more principles onto Fuller's list and says, well, we can, we need all of these principles if we're going to have a functioning legal order, but all they do is they make law into a more effective instrument. And uh, then he uses the analogy of a knife. He says, what's the virtue of a knife? The specific virtue of a knife is sharpness. Well, of course, we can do different things with a sharp knife. I can make a, a lovely dinner, or I could uh, stab Thomas because I was uh, offended by things that he said about me, not that he said anything offensive. They were just compliments for which I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, but one's choice of instrument is very important here. This is a thought that uh, struck me uh, after writing this book, unfortunately. And that is, imagine that if we thought of law more like a spanner, a little spanner than a knife. It will change our understanding of what kind of instrument law is, because a spanner uh, can only be used for certain purposes. And uh, if we have to understand the instrument in terms of the purposes or values that it serves, that makes a great deal of difference to our understanding of law. So if we go back to uh, Hobbes, Hobbes says uh, in chapter 30 of Leviathan that if we want to understand the work that law does in our lives, it's... Uh, he uses the metaphor of a hedge. He says that uh, law is like a hedge. Hedges direct the traveler on his way without telling him where to go. And this is an idea that's actually picked up by Hayek later on when he talks about law, signpost law. It's picked up by Oakeshott in uh, his essay on the rule of law, where he talks, talks about law as just uh, setting adverbial conditions for us to observe in doing things that we want to do. And, and this we can regard law as instrumental in this way, but it's instrumental to uh, peace, regulation of violence, uh, peaceful human interaction. And uh, that, that, I think, is, is wide pragmatism, not narrow pragmatism. Raz, if anything, is a, a narrow pragmatism just because he has this very instrumental view of law. OK, so um, thank you, David. Thank you, Thomas, for your insightful thought. Uh, speeches talks uh and for this brilliant overview not only of her book but also much of her recent research and i would like to second thomas when he said that one of the virtues i see in your work is that you manage to connect legal theory to very pressing political issues in a way that shows that what we do here is not only an intellectual exercise it's also a tool for understanding these issues so uh we still have some time i think we can be here until about half past noon uh so i would like to open to the audience if they have any questions i have a question of my own but i can leave it for later maybe lunch so kai please yes you need the microphone hello hello 
Hello, first, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the book I read, well, all the book also, all yeah. scratched here. Uh, so I have three questions. Um, the first question is, you end the book quoting a passage which appeared on Justice for Hedgehogs, on Justice for Hedgehogs manuscript, but on, not on the final version, where the working said that uh, we should deal with the presumption that um, all political societies uh, had an obligation to obey the law. And then you, it's not on the final version and you said it should be. Uh, I I wonder if that is so, if we're really in charge me that a lot of, or maybe most of past political societies, at least on the West, were submitted to huge oppression. So I'd like to hear you a bit on that. And I, I have, however, an hypothesis, hypothesis for for the answer of this question, which leads lead me to my second question. You mentioned also on the book page 167 that Kelsen's fundamental norm was a postulate of peace. So maybe law was able to avoid conflict on many, uh, maybe most societies, and that would be enough to create an obligation to obey the law. So I would like to hear you on if that's a, a correct reading of what you're saying, Kelsen is saying. Uh, anyway, my second question is whether under a Durkinian framework, you would say that peace would be lost point. And my third and last question is about the concept of voidable norms, which appears on the page 403, 404 of the book. Uh, that, that concept would enlighten us on the attitude of a citizen of, of the attitude a citizen should have towards law when he finds law might be invalid. He should um, presume the law is valid until a court says it is not. I would like to hear you a bit more on how that is related uh, with the divide between static and dynamic theories of law. Um, and I would also like to hear you on if uh, taking a uh, dynamic theory of law as the preferred kind of theory, um, which we would necessarily be led to the conclusion that the citizen should not just disobey and he should uh, wait for the court to say what is right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think I managed to... Uh... I think I managed to get uh, the four questions, but if I don't get them right, you can remind me. So, so is, is it Daniel, your, your name? Yeah, my name is Daniel. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I just want to make sure I've got your name right. So, yeah. so, so Daniel and I had a discussion before the session started about uh, someone, uh, a philosopher, and I, th I think it's fair to say that we're both fans of this philosopher, uh, Bernard Williams. And Bernard Williams, in, in a wonderful essay on... Uh, critical essay uh, of, of Dworkin's understanding of uh, legitimacy and generally Rawls and Dworkin. I think this came out of a seminar that he was teaching with Dworkin in Oxford at the time, it says that uh, liberal theories of legitimacy make a, 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 what Williams regards as a kind of obvious mistake. What is the obvious mistake? If we think that in order for a society to be legitimate, it has to correspond with ex-philosophers uh, theory of legitimacy, it will appear that hardly any societies in human history have been legitimate, and maybe no society could ever be legitimate. And one can actually find traces of these thoughts sometimes in Raz's work on legitimacy. It's not clear that Raz thinks that a, a political and legal order could ever be legitimate. In principle, it could be, but he thinks it's very unlikely to be realized in practice. And yet we have political and legal orders existing now, existing in time, where by and large the population have thought of the legal order and the political order uh, as, as uh, legitimate. So how do we make uh, sense of that? W w Williams uh, suggests that we have to move some distance away from uh, liberal criteria of legitimacy in order to understand the phenomenon of legitimacy. And I think that's right. And the reason why I took that uh, paragraph from the manuscript of Dawkins' book is there, I think he was endorsing something like uh, Williams's uh, view. There, there are many uh, things in Dawkins that are against this view, which is why Williams criticized Dawkins as one of the liberal moralists. 
but I, th I think that is the, the preferred uh, view. So that's my uh, first answer to your first question. Uh, with Kelson and uh, the postulate of peace, uh, does this lead, I think your question was, to an obligation to obey the law? Is that the correct reading? Yes, I think it is. But, le but let me go back, and I might do this again, to my favorite political and legal philosopher, that's Hobbes. Right? There, there, there are many passages in Leviathan where Hobbes seems to say, if you're uh, living under the rule of an effective ruler, you should regard that ruler as uh, legitimate. Why? Because it's better to live subject to some sovereign than to be, no matter what, how, what you think of that sovereign, than to be in a state of nature. And, and that uh, looks like a kind of absurd idea, right? You could have a highly oppressive sovereign, but you should regard that sovereign as not oppressive. Why? Because you know that being in a state of nature would be worse. My argument about Hobbes, and then I try to show that Kelson uh, presents us with an updated for the 20th century version of this argument, is that uh, for Hobbes and for Kelson, the value of peace is not just the absence of uh, chaos, and it's not just uh, not having uh, disorder. It's a very particular kind of order. It's a kind of order that allows for a certain kind of human interaction on uh, peaceful terms uh, where individuals can to use a liberal idea, uh, pursue their own good in their own way. And I think one can find that in both Hobbes and uh, in Kelson. And when that's in place, then there is indeed an obligation uh, to obey uh, the law. And uh, that might help me with the answer to the third question, because if that's right, then we're approaching something like uh, Dworkin's understanding of the point of law. It's, it's, a, it's a much more complex understanding of the value of peace but it would have to be short of uh, most thick liberal understandings in order to not have a criterion of legitimacy that just reduced legitimacy to one or other liberal philosopher's understanding of uh, legitimacy. Okay, last question. Voidable and uh, void, static and dynamic theories. Should the citizen uh, wait? So that was the end of the question. Yes, I think the citizen uh, should wait. At, and uh, for Kelson, uh, Kel but I think one can make the same claim about Hobbes. The idea of sovereignty is uh, very complex. Kelson didn't like uh, the idea of sovereignty. He thought it was a politically pernicious idea. At the end of the book from which I had the long uh, quotation, his 1920 book on sovereignty, he says we should actually get rid of the idea of sovereignty altogether. Why? Because it's so prone to political abuse. But I think he does have a theory of sovereignty, at least in the sense of ultimate legal authority. But so what is an exercise of ultimate legal authority or sovereignty? We don't know the content of that exercise until we've gone through a whole process. So until we've journeyed down uh, the hierarchy of norms to the point of uh, law application by an official to a citizen. So it's a law at its most uh, concrete. And at that point, I think for Kelson, uh, the uh, citizen has to be able to ask the question, which I say should be the question of philosophy of law, but how can that be law for me? Is entitled then to get an, an, uh, a, a judgment from an a official independent of the official who made the decision as to whether that first official did act within the limits of that official's uh, authority. Now, 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 let's say that the judge or other adjudicative official confirms that what the official, uh, the first official did was uh, within the limits of that official's authority, but the citizen is still dissatisfied. So here I, I want to uh, distinguish, and this goes a bit to the idea of Protestant interpretation, between two kinds of dissatisfaction. You, you, one might say as the affected citizen, well, I just think that the content of the law is immoral. If, if that's all uh, that one can say, I think one still has an obligation to obey the law. If one uh, can say something different, that it, there's something wrong with this law because it reduces my subject status in an impermissible way. It makes me less than equal before the law. Then I think one's relationship between, with, between uh, oneself as a subject and uh, one's ruler is, is, is uh, in, in trouble. 
and I, I think for Kels my understanding of Kelson's idea of uh, void and voidable norms is that uh, norms that are from the outset void will be norms that reduce the legal subject status in the impermissible way. Voidable norms are norms ab about which there's a kind of question which maybe won't be answered in the way that the subject wants them answered. That if they aren't answered in the way that the subject wants them answered, the subject is still under an obligation to abide by those norms. So actually, I think now that I've tried to answer all four of your questions, and maybe this is the reason why you asked all four, that they actually form a kind of seamless uh, set of questions, because I think the same issues travel throughout all four. Uh, hi, many thanks for, for your talk. That was that was brilliant. And it is really impressive to see how you effortlessly move from analytical jurisprudence with Hart and Ras to Kelsen to Oakshot. And it's really impressive the sort of the the, the breadth of the, 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 the presentation. My question, I think it's it's a really short one. And I will and maybe you actually answer that in the book then. I should write the book. Too. Uh, but my question is the following one. So you're basically presenting your argument as a sort of a way out of the deadlock between natural law and legal positivism. And the key is that arrow in your second picture with reciprocity. However, the thing that I'm puzzled and like to hear a bit more is about the thing you understand as the first question of jurisprudence, which was Thomas's last point. The question that how can that be the law for me? So now, if you take this as a first question of jurisprudence, how can that be the law for me? The question that I have, the question I'm wondering is if this first question of jurisprudence is not already tilting the balance against legal positivism, why that? Because asking why, how can that be the law for me implies that the law has any importance whatsoever. It's It, it, conflate, it seems to me that it's conflating two questions. The, first, the one question is why should I care about this? Which is really the most important question. Why should I care about something? And the second question about the law, I think there might be a conflict between those two questions there because the way as it is presented here, it presupposes that the law matters. And that's precisely the point that uh, it's under contention in the natural law versus the positive debate, that the law actually has some sort of punch, so to say. Natural necessarily has some punch. That that's that seems to be implying the question. So that's that's my my doubt. Thank you. All right. So so why why uh, presuppose that uh, law matters? So that, that that's the kind of nub of the question, right? And uh, the suggestion is that uh, legal positivists tell us that however complex a phenomenon law is that complexity doesn't get us to the conclusion that law matters in that uh, the law should have normative force for you such that you should care about the law or I should care about the law. And and one of the ways I try to uh, answer your question, so it's not that I'm claiming I succeed in answering the question in the book, but one of the ways I, I try to answer that question in the book is to uh, show that uh, legal positivists actually have a great deal of trouble in avoiding the conclusion uh, that uh, law matters. And uh, one will find some quite striking uh, formulations in uh, legal positivists. So one that I uh, quote maybe more than twice in the book is uh, John Gardner's claim that, uh, we sh that law is normatively inert. And uh, and then there are all the claims that uh, uh, Raz makes about law's authority, where uh, he thinks that by and large law has de facto authority, but not uh, legitimate or de jure authority. Uh, Hart uh, never put things in Raz's way, which I find significant. So Raz, when Raz talks about authority, Raz always says that law claims authority. You'll never find Hart saying that law claims authority. He's interested in the authority that law has, not the authority that law claims. But he is worried about the further uh, point that Raz makes, which he actually takes from uh, Kelson on the strong reading of Kelson's uh, uh, 
uh, theory of uh, legal authority that uh, law not only claims authority, but claims uh, legitimate authority. And Raz Hart says, well, that introduces a moral component into philosophy of law, which I should reject. So what I want to do is to take the strong reading with Hart's understanding of authority, that law has authority, and say that uh, there's something absurd in supposing that law is a matter of norms, but that these norms are normatively inert or morally inert. That law has authority, but really it doesn't have authority because it doesn't matter. So I think positivists get themselves into a whole host of problems because they want to at the same time say that law does matter, it is normative, it has authority, it's not the gunman situation writ large. And then on the other hand, they say, oh, but it really doesn't matter. So one could take the stance that law doesn't matter, but I don't think that legal positivists succeed in taking that stance. So I work with, if you like, the internal tensions in legal positivism to say, well, here's a better understanding, which they sometimes get close to of showing uh, why law matters. Uh, thank you, Professor Deisinghaus, for your talk and all your work. I, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to read the whole book. Well, maybe fortunately, you never. No, know. <laughs> I read, I read the introduction and some uh, of your other work, but uh, not the whole book. So maybe my question is answered in the book, but I would like to uh, pose it anyway because I think it relates somehow with uh, Thomas's uh, comments about uh, pragmatism and. Uh, uh, in what way Kelsen can be considered a, a, a pragmatist. So uh, my, my question um, builds on this uh, idea that you just uh, stated that uh, Hart is worried to uh, explain loss of authority somehow. Like uh, uh, he, he has, uh, this goal of showing how law can create authority for people, right? I, I don't know if that much uh, uh, is right on your view, but uh, Hart is committed with the separability thesis, and so he uh, he's not willing to let a moral component enters in in that explanation. That's why he creates um, this idea that uh, law is uh, somehow based on the great agreement that is called the rule of recognition. And the rule of recognition uh, is, uh, is, a, is an attitude, uh, in the way I see it, is an attitude of agreement, like a shared agreement on the criteria for legal validity. So, ah, um, uh, I, I have some difficult to see what advantages we can uh, have for legal theory in abandoning this idea of a social practice of agreement that it may be incorrect. And I, I myself think it is, and I, I, I think uh, you, you too. Uh, and uh, turning back to something like Kelsen's basic norm, which is not a social practice whatsoever. It's like a cognitive postulate. Uh, it's like a, 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 yeah, it's not a social practice. So it's something that uh, it doesn't, uh, I, 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 I really, I don't, grasp it, how can uh, this can refer to uh, the game of giving and asking for reasons, because it's a cognitive postulate. So uh, one can argue that it's, uh, it's not normative at all, because it's situated outside the space of reasons, to use uh, Silesian and uh, uh, Brandomian uh, vocabulary. Uh, so uh, I, I think my my main uh, uh, question uh, would be that, uh, and it's like uh, um, a worry that maybe what we should do is to uh, 
advance the hearting idea of the law as a social practice, but not of agreement, law as a social practice of uh, disagreement. Some something that working has uh, done uh, with the idea of protest Protestant interpretation and, and all of that. But, uh, and then maybe this is a second question. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm finishing, <laughs> sorry. Uh, maybe this is a second question. And, and uh, the challenge I see uh, for doing that, like to uh, theorizing law as a practice of disagreement is that we are, uh, very uh, um, we 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 ought to be uh, careful with uh, what Robert Brandon calls the expector of sexism, the idea that we won't have any uh, semantic stances to uh, to assure that something is a legal uh, enactment. And something uh, uh, and, and our legal norms actually have content that it can be uh, uh, stated. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I think the second part was a, a bit confusing, but I, I hope the, the, the first part uh, was okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think I got the second part, but you can tell me whether when I get to it that I, that I, I, I got it wrong. But so there were there were uh, several parts to the first, several components to the first part, and uh, I might not be able to respond to all of them. But but let me try. So so let me start with uh, something that came a little bit later, which is the separation thesis. I prefer to call it the separation thesis, just because I think that uh, this idea of a separability thesis, which came uh, later under the influence of inclusive legal positivists, if you ever get to read further in my book and get to, I think it's a, Appendix uh, 2, you'll see I don't really have much time for uh, this uh, movement, which was called inclusive or incorporationist legal positivism. I think that they really just capitulated to Dworkin and pretended to hang on to some kind of legal positivism. But when you read what people uh, like Gardner, I think in the essay I referred to before, say about the separation thesis, uh, also Leslie Green has said these things, I say, oh, Hart never held the separation thesis, that's nonsense. If you look at all the connections that Hart saw between law and morality, of course, he never uh, held to anything like the separation thesis. Well, of course, Hart held to the separation thesis. That whole essay and then much of uh, chapter nine of the concept of law is devoted to defending the separation thesis. I think it's just nonsense to claim that he never held to the separation thesis. But I think those bits which uh, his followers uh, depend on in order to make the claim that he never are just the kinds of things where Hart was having trouble uh, holding on to his view that law doesn't matter. He did think that law mattered, but he always shied away from accepting the implications uh, of that. Now, now, when it comes to Hart and uh, authority, I, I think that, I, and I haven't mentioned this before, but I think it's been implicit in some of the things that we've talked about uh, today. Hart makes, I think, a very significant move in the concept of law when he says that uh, only the uh, officials of uh, a legal order need have what Hart calls the internal point of view. He says if uh, the uh, legal subjects could only adopt the external point of view, perhaps because the law generally was oppressive, this would be a terrible society but it, and might be very unstable, but still it could function as a uh, legal society. So the uh, officials there, Hart says in chapter nine, uh, their voluntary uh, activity constitutes the authority of the legal order. And what I want to do through introducing uh, this question, but how can this be law for me into uh, philosophy of law, is to say, no, it's not just legal officials. Uh, also, subjects have a role in constituting uh, the authority of the legal order uh, through their practice. And, and this goes back a little bit to the answer to the question about Kelson, that there's this process of concretization, which the subject may challenge and as a right may challenge at the end of the process, whether the, that challenge is going to be uh, successful or not. And uh, here, and this is more my current work than uh, what I say in the book, although I do gesture it in the book, what I'm currently working on 
and I intimated this earlier when I said that Austin was a far more sophisticated philosopher of law than generally pe people suppose. I actually think that Austin's habit of obedience, which Hart wanted to ditch when he moved away from the command model of law, is an extremely important idea for uh, philosophy of law. The habit of obedience is constitutive of uh, the authority of an order, and uh, that's the subjects as well as uh, the officials. Now, of course, the habit of obedience might uh, coalesce around some very bad views. So the uh, quotation that Thomas read out, where I say in 19th century Britain, women were regarded as second-class citizens, that this was a, a, this was a view that people were barely conscious of the fact that women were second-class citizens. When John Stuart Mill uh, writes his feminist tract on the subjection of women, he makes this point that if one, he doesn't put it quite this way, if one took an opinion poll of most women in uh, England at the time he was writing, they'd probably think that their status was, well, that's just the natural order of things. But still, there were things within the legal and political order that disturbed that, uh, th that sense, that this is just the natural order of things. And this idea that uh, there's this internal dynamic to law that's capable of building on tensions in the law to reveal injustices is supposed to tell us that uh, that legal practices are, to borrow a term that uh, Thomas uh, took uh, from uh, Branham, that corrigible. Why? Because there is this kind of logic to law. There is this grammar of law that makes uh, law into a reflective practice as well as a practice that just tells people what to do. And uh, I think that the mistake with uh, Hart's rather static understanding of legal positivism is it neglects this dynamic aspect of, of law. Although Hart actually comes quite close to it in his chapter on justice in chapter seven, a very much neglected chapter of uh, the concept of law. So the last thing I want to say about your first question is this idea of the postulate of uh, uh, Kelson's postulate or basic norm as just, as just something cognitive, something situated outside the space of reasons. Right? So, so what I want to do is to take that postulate and plonk it firmly within uh, the space of reasons and turn it into what uh, Dworkin called, and which I call a regulative assumption, that we need to make sense of practice. And uh, there are two really quite different views of the basic norm in, in, in Kelsen, and he's ambiguous, I think, throughout his work on, uh, on, on this issue. So there's a hierarchy of norms where uh, the norms just travel down the hierarchy, and somehow one has to presuppose the basic norm in order to make sense of this. And then there's the basic norm understood as the presupposition we have to adopt if we're going to understand our legal order as a meaningful whole. And if we think that the second is the better understanding of the basic norm, which is what I think, then I think we get a completely different view of uh, uh, Kelson. And uh, this, uh, Thomas and I were talking about this uh, last night, but there's a... Uh, a very interesting essay by Dworkin, which uh, most people don't know, and which I think Dworkin himself had forgotten about, and which he wrote in uh, the early 1960s in a volume of uh, collected volume on political and legal theory, in which Hart published for the first time his major critique of Kelson. And Dworkin uh, was the respondent to Hart's paper, and he defends Kelson, and he defends Kelson's monism and his account on the basic norm in a way that, that anticipates the idea which Dworkin hadn't yet come up with and wouldn't come up with for many years of the of law as integrity. And th there's also a, a very uh, interesting essay by Tony Honoré, who's one of the more neglected philosophers of law, on uh, Kelson, where he says that if you take Kelson's basic norm in the second sense as a regulative assumption, there's actually very little distance between Kelson's understanding of the work that the basic norm does and Dworkin's idea of, of uh, principled integrity. So one has to kind of go against the orthodoxy of Kelson scholarship to have this view of Kelson. But since just about every Kelson scholar think, will think that my view of Kelson is nonsense, uh, I'm, I'm used to uh, going against uh, the orthodoxy. All right, I think that on the way to uh, answering your first question, I tried to answer uh, the second about uh, practice. And I think as you put it, borrowing from random, the, the specter of sexism, is was that the term? Yes. Yeah, so it's, I, I think that uh, 
we live, and to put things rather dramatically, are doomed to live with injustices that we don't even notice. And, and that seems to me to be human history. But I, th I think that law can play a part in bringing to light those injustices and correcting them. And so that's uh, this kind of the dynamic understanding of law is supposed to do that uh, for us. So we are running out of time. We only have time for maybe one or two more questions. So Marina will speak. Maybe if we have time left, I'll ask one last question. So please, Marina. Okay, so thank you, Professor Dysonhouse. I was here also in uh, 2018, yeah. and I'm now, and it's a joy yeah. to see you again. Oh, and you. Um, so uh, I was thinking about your lecture and also the paper you, you sent us to, to read, and I'm um, guessing we can make a typology. So there's the rule of law state, and there's everything else. And uh, among these types and everything else, we've got like the dual state, the apartheid state, and also the parallel state. But you also say that uh, within the apartheid state, there are general norms and there's like a form of perverse rule of law state. So how can we cope with these um, ambiguities? And uh, would it be like non-rule of law state or a kind of weak rule of law anyway? So this is the first question, and the bonus question would be about um, the adjudication as not a philosophy of law. So I, I was curious, uh, you mentioned your supervisor, Ras, talking about it, so I, I, I'd like to, re to hear more about it. So would it not be philosophy of law, or do you think it is? Because it's, because, I mean, clearly you think it is, but uh, why? <laughs> how, how come can it not be? Um, so yeah. that's it. Thank you. So, so the, 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 the first question is one that I uh, really struggle with, and I'm not sure that I have a satisfactory answer. So it's in uh, my book and uh, in the paper that uh, was circulated, I present uh, these different uh, conceptions of state as ideal types of state. And then there's a continuum of legality, right? So at the one end, we have the, uh, the ideal rule of law state, and then the dual state falls off the continuum. And then in between, we have these other uh, ki kind, dual, other ideal types of state, the apartheid state, the parallel state, and uh, so on. And uh, when people ask me this kind of question, I've, I've, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. as so I, I gave this paper last November at uh, at NYU in this colloquium that uh, Waldron, that, that Waldron, Jeremy Waldron and uh, Sam Scheffler run, which is the incarnation of the colloquium that uh, Dworkin and Thomas Nagel put together. And, and it's a kind of grueling experience because it's really a seven hour colloquium, this. So there's, you start off with lunch, but all you talk about at lunch is your paper. Then there's a, a four hour colloquium and then uh, you go get you go to dinner, but you don't get to eat because you have to keep answering uh, questions. And and this was one of the your question was one of the main questions on which people pressed me, and they convinced me at that time that actually I only had two uh, ideal types of state: the ideal one, and then the state that falls off. But then I've gone back to thinking that maybe there are more. But but I think the answer, and maybe it's not a very satisfactory answer. And I talk about this in I think in my chapter on the po politics of uh, legal space is that all states are hybrid states. That is, all states will have elements of uh, prerogative within them. Uh, there will be second-class citizens in all states, but still we can place states on the continuum depending on whether they live up better or worse to the ideal of the rule of law. So the, the point about an ideal type is that it doesn't actually exist in reality. It's a way of abstracting from reality. So when we go back to reality, we can make better sense of reality. The ideal type then turns out to dissolve, but we have a better understanding of uh, what we were tr trying to uh, uh, work with in the first place. So I know that's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's that, that's the answer. I know I need to do a whole lot more uh, work on it. Okay, adjudication, uh, not uh, philosophy of law. I, I, I always thought this was rather a, a cheap objection to uh, Dworkin, that he had, 
was a mere theory of adjudication, nothing to do with philosophy of law. It's something that Raz said often, uh, Hart said it, uh, Gardner says it. Gardner at one point uh, talks of uh, as Dworkin as a theoretically ambitious lawyer. Uh, he's not really doing philosophy of law at all. Why? Because he's talking about all this parochial stuff, how judges decide cases. Whereas I think that all that parochial stuff is very important for philosophers of law uh, to understand. And it is philosophy of law, but I, I think one can say that without, uh, I should say, by the way, that Dworkin was my main supervisor. And it was only because he was half-time at NYU that I got to work with uh, Raz and also with uh, John Finnis when Dworkin was away. So I had three supervisors, which is, was very unusual in Oxford, still unusual uh, today. And uh, I, I, I think one can contest the claim that uh, adjudication is not philosophy of law without becoming a Dworkinian, because there is a sense in which I think Dworkin's theory of adjudication is quite parochial. What, what is Dworkin's theory of adjudication? It's a theory of adjudication, which he crafted looking at the Warren Court, right? So the most liberal court in the his Supreme Court in the history of the United States. And I've had the experience in uh, the last couple of years teaching texts, which I've taught for now uh, I don't know, over 30 years. So Dawkins text from the 1970s about uh, interpretation. And you, you feel like you're talking about an era that has gone because he's, he's talking about this kind of march of progress, Roe v. Wade and everything that came before it. And then you look at what's happening in the United States now, and uh, we seem to be, at least on my view, going uh, backwards, not forward anymore. And so, so, so I think Dworkin's theory of interpretation is a theory of interpretation for a particular time and place. But I think every general legal theory needs such a theory. So I, I think that uh, legal theory is a movement between the parochial and the more general. And uh, so one can't get rid of theories of adjudication from general legal theory because every general legal theory will be committed to some theory of uh, adjudication. And actually, one can see traces of this in, for example, uh, Kelson, that when he did talk about adjudication, he tended to have a, something like what uh, Dworkin thinks of as a plain fact view of adjudication, and if there aren't plain facts there, then judges just have discretion, as Hart said. But that is still a view of adjudication, I think. So it's almost half past noon. I'm afraid we don't have time for my own question, which I'll try to ask later, maybe. Uh, before ending, I would like to thank everyone who attended here and to remind everyone that Professor Dyson-House will be here for uh, two, and two other events this week. On Wednesday, we'll talk about his paper on positivism and totalitarianism, which will be tra was translated to Portuguese, will be published on, in December. So you're all invited, of course. And on Friday, uh, Professor Dyson-House will be speaking about... Um, the rule of law and the rule of exception, is that right? Yeah, st states of emergency, states of exception, rule of law. Carl Schmidt, the way uh, it surprised you. It, yeah. it, it, yes, yeah. Or, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, as part of Professor Ronaldo's uh, postgraduate course, a graduate course, actually, but we're, you're all invited too. So I hope you see you then. Thank you, David, again. Thank you, Thomas, for being here. Uh, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.